Minister in the MI coupling, uh, first I would like to acknowledge a few people here, Ray Robo, Art Richman at the NCAR, and the Joe Huba at the NRL. So for those not familiar with the model, first I will give a brief introduction about the time GCM, uh, which the, this talk is primarily based on, and then I'll we'll move uh, forward with uh, some, uh, to illustrate some of the effects from the storm uh, concerning aurora geo heating inputs and the ring current energetic particles. And finally, I, f uh, I show some more recent results from the coupled time GCM and the semi-3. So uh, time G uh, GCM stands for Summersphere Ionosphere Mesosphere Electrodynamics General Circulation Model. It incorporates uh, various photochemical, ch chemical, uh, dynamical, electrodynamical um, processes uh, suitable for the region from 35 to 700 kilometers uh, mm -hmm. during solar maximum and about 30 kilometers to about 500 kilometers during solar minimum. In addition to the various uh, physical um, process, uh, dynamic processes, and the model also solved four major uh, neutral species and two dozens also minor species and uh, um, some, a few um, ion species as well. So the lower boundary of the time GCM, considering um, tides and the printed waves from an uh, empirical model of a global scale wave model or from the uh, reanalysis data from NCEP and the ECWMF, then in the, on the up boundary, uh, it inputs various solar energetic particles, aurora particles, and uh, high latitude convection uh, Rod has to talk about because iron, uh, the energy input from the magnetosphere is indeed one of the major drivers of the thermosphere dynamics. So uh, we're using more primary data to uh, specify those inputs then for aurora and high, energy, uh, high latitude convection we are primarily using the AMI processes uh, to give more realistic description of these forces. Um, in terms of thermosphere dynam uh, dynamics in response to gen um, geomagnetic storm, it is very well described this by this cartoon about 35 years ago by Ray Robo. So um, during low uh, quiet time, um, the primary circulation of the thermosphere is, primary, uh, is mainly from the equator to pole driven by the solar heating. Then at the high latitude, you have this reversed uh, circulation due to the uh, weak energy input in the aurora zone. Then as the activity uh, intensifies, and then the high latitude reverse uh, circulation uh, become more uh, intensified, then during major storms, and those reversed uh, circulation can totally overtaken the normal equator to pole water circulation. So um, just to illustrate those effects, I'm going to show simulations from those well-known uh, Halloween storm in 2003. So top panel shows the potential drop uh, in both hemisphere derived from Amy. So um, you can see that the peak of the uh, potential drop is to reach about 30, uh, 350 uh, kilovolts, which is very, very strong. Then the middle panel shows the hemisphere integrated dew heating dissipation into the upper hemisphere, again in the different colors for the different hemispheres. Um, and you can see that the peak of this um, on day 30, October 30, reached more than five uh, terawatts. So considering that the total power consumption in the entire United States is about 800 gigawatts, and those energy dissipation is really enormous if we only if we could find a way to harvest those energy, um, that'd be uh, very economically beneficial. Um, then on the bottom panel uh, shows the energy uh, dissipation through energetic particles. Um, primarily, uh, the, what I'm plotting here is the electron, the, the low energy electron below 30 keV in mean energy. Again, in the third, um, uh, in both hemisphere by the different colors and compared with dew heating, so, and this, the energy carried by those energetic particles are by the order of magnitude smaller than the geohene dissipation. So the, and the October event also features the, the fourth largest the solar proton uh, event. And however, the energy carried by those protons are if by the order of magnitude smaller than those by the um, uh, aurora precipitations, as you've seen here. This is the blue color is from the uh, global map of 
measured by the NOAA Pulse satellite and have to scale back by factor of five in order to make the same plots here. And uh, there are three episodes of intensified energy dissipation during those uh, four-day period. And the first one associated with uh, sheath raging, the other two uh, due to the CME itself. And here's the, just a map showing how the intensification looked like during storm and versus during quiet time. So those are the, um, the colors, are the uh, dew heat dissipation, height uh, high integrated dew heat dissipation, the contours of the convection, plasma convection pattern during quiet time on the earlier of the October 29th, then during 20 UT, uh, the peak of the, uh, the second peak of the storm, and you can see dramatic enhancement of dew heating dissipation. Then comparing with the, uh, these are the bottom panel shows the global maps of energy flux carried by the aurora energy. And you have, uh, one thing I want to point out, the color scale different for uh, dew heating is about go up to 100 gigawatts per uh, milliwatts per meter in those are quarters smaller for energetic particles. Um, so how the global atmosphere some uh, then responds to those kind of energy dissipation. So plot here um, on the horizontal axis, the days from, uh, this is five days on the, on the uh, listed in the bottom, and the, the top panel here showing the black line is the reverse, the DST, and the red lines uh, the dew heating, the dotted line is the five minutes values, and the smooth line is the three, uh, three hour running average. So one interesting point is the peak of the uh, dew heating always preceding uh, the peak of the reverse DST by two to three hours, which is probably associated with the fact that that's the time it takes for energetic particles moving, propagating from a distance tail to the inner magnetosphere and energizing to enhance the ring current. And the, the second pa uh, the panel here shows the um, neutral temperature enhancement at the different heights indicated by the different colors of the lines. And there's also time delay in terms of thermosphere response. Again, it takes about two to three or th sometimes three to four hours, depends on where, where the attitude you are looking at. So there's a time delay in terms of thermosphere response um, to the energy dissipation from high latitude. Then the, the, again, in the bottom um, is the mass density uh, at the different heights. So again, there are, those have been scaled. So one interesting thing, um, which we're still trying to figure out more detail how the, what kind of physical process driving that, that is the peak of the density has seems like have a time dependence, uh, attitude dependence in terms of the response. So higher, uh, quicker in the high latitude and slower in the low latitude. However, such Attitude dependence is not very obvious uh, in the temperature. Um, next, I'm going to talk about those energetic particle effect, and uh, these are the um, sketch. Uh, the plots is adopted from uh, uh, Charlie Jackman. So, two primary sources we are most interested in is the solar energetic protons and the ring current energetic particles. So, um, the energy dissipation range for uh, SEPs um, is quite wide. It's all the way from a 20 uh, kilometers or 10 to 15 kilometers down to about 100 kilometers. Then for ring current electrons, those are the particles above 30 keV to MeV. So, and those energy mostly dissipating above about 50 kilometers. And uh, here's the, uh, the different layers of the upper atmosphere. Okay, so, um, so the event um, we simulated is the September 2005. It's a moderate storm. And here are the um, energy, uh, the maps of different electrons at a different for the different energy channels based on the NOAA Pulse satellites. And at the bottom four patterns are the protons. Those are during quiet times on the 6 UT at the September 10th. Then on the one day later on the September 11th, there was an enhanced uh, ring current uh, injections, and you see the uh, order of more than order of magnitude of number flux or the uh, for all these different channels of particles. So how that affect the upper atmosphere? Then, uh, you know, first we, you know, to using that to drive the model, we have to fit in those uh, frog, those um, differential frogs into a uh, mean energy and, and uh, energy frogs and mean energy. Uh, what I'm showing here are the two primary different types of primary particle 
input to the time GCM. These are, these are the auroral particles, and those are the medium energy electrons, which is above 30 uh, K, uh, keV to 1 MeV, then here are the protons. Um, note that the color bar scales are different. This is, so the energy flux from the uh, aurora electrons is about five times larger than the, the other two. And the mean energy uh, for electrons, mostly a few keV, and the four uh, energetic electrons, those high energy particles usually does not carry as, much, as many particles as uh, those, um, the others. So for those most energy, for, the, for this particular time, and it's mainly um, with co correlating with the energy is about 40, 45 keV. And similarly for protons, uh, the majority of the um, particles perceiving with the large energy flux has come from the region uh, with about four, four, 35 to 40 keV um, energy range. And the energy, how, how deep those energy particles can penetrate the upper atmosphere really depends on how energetic those particles are. And the top row showing here the ionization rate of at the midnight local time and over the latitude from 40 to the pole. Um, so, um, and the, the vertical axis is a, it's nonlinear. And you can see that for um, aurora electrons, the peak uh, height is about 110 kilometers, and for uh, medium energy ring current electrons, it depends really further down to about 85 kilometers. And the for protons, um, those uh, medium um, MiPad energy part protons, is about 130 kilometers. So, and the bottom is basically the horizontal distribution of those um, the ionization rate at those peak heights. And if you recall that, comparing with the the energy flux distribution, they are very much, uh, the morphology of the ionization pretty much proportional to the energy flux. And those kind of ionization not only produce uh, electron, intensify the electrons, it also cause chemical reactions due to in change of uh, uh, association to pr production rates of the particles. And what I'm showing here, here's the electrons uh, percentage change of electrons, so you basically get uh, 100 times more electrons in the, in the D regions um, due to those uh, ring current energy electron precipitations. And then those, uh, uh, energy, uh, those precipitations also cause intensified NOx, which is a, a major, have some impact on the auto production and also HOX, and, and intensification also appears. However, uh, however unlike the NOx, uh, the hawks have very uh, relatively short time life, and when its source is gone, and then they just recover very quickly, whereas NOx can last for a very long time. And uh, both NOx and hawks can produce ozone destruction, which is the main concern of uh, climate change in the, if it's happening in the lower upper atmosphere. But for the, in this case, those ozone uh, destruction is mostly caused by hawks rather than NOx, so their lifetime is relatively short. However, as I said, that for if the energy is more energetic, then they can penetrate further deep down into the upper atmosphere, then may cause a long-lasting climate effect. And this is exactly the case during the Halloween storm. And those are the uh, ozone, uh, the NOx changes in both northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere, due to the precipitating um, solar energetic protons. And the peak of this, as you can see, that start from 50 kilometers in the uh, detrend, uh, descending down into the upper atmosphere. Consequently, the, la um, the change of ozone depletion is very long-lasting as well, lasts for many months, several months at least. Um, so, and I said that um, although the time GCM is a very, very powerful tool, useful tool for understanding the thermosphere dynamics, however, it has some intrinsic delimitations Two of the major uh, limitation of the time GCM is that one is that it has a very fixed, it has a fixed upper boundary at about 680 kilometers or 700 kilometers or so. Then second limitation is it has utilizing a prescribed uh, O plus flux. So the plus, the, that prevents plus to freely uh, cross the upper boundary. Um, we know that during storm time, the upper atmosphere can fluctuate in quite a bit. So, you know, to eliminating those kind of uh, uh, 
lim limitations by uh, in the time GCM. So recently we have tried to couple in the time GCM with the semi-3. So semi-3 is the global atmosphere model extending from about 90 kilometers to several Earth radii. Um, this is right now, it's a one-way coupling. We're basically using the neutral species uh, calculated from a time GCM plus the neutral wind and the neutral temperature to drive semi to see how the storm look like with those coupled model. And I said, uh, so what I here in this, uh, right now, um, in the time GCM, the upper uh, the O plus plus at the upper boundary is very simplistic. You basically have a weak up flow during the daytime and a weak down flow on the night time. And here's the terminator. However, if now we look at using the coupled model, we don't need to use that anymore. And though, so this is a, a, another storm, and which is caused by penetration electric field from high latitude to low latitude, and the, the, the storm uh, the, the penetration take place starting at about 1930 UT on that day. So prior, even prior to that, you can see that the distribution of O plus flux at 680 kilometers far from those simplistic specification. Uh, imposed in the time GCM, you consider uh, consists of localized enhanced upward downward flows. Then during those penetration effects, you can see the dramatic change, increasing first increasing near the magnetic equator regions, and then uh, followed by downward drifting of the plasma when the IMF turns northward. So it is very very dynamic situation during the storm time, and make it very difficult to really uh, specify those kind of flux um, at the at, uh, in the ionosphere because those are actually important uh, seed, uh, source uh, seedings for uh, ion outflow at the, um, in the, from the ionosphere to the magnetosphere eventually. And here, those are the O plus flux, and now look at this is H plus uh, at 600 also um, kilometers. Again, uh, different, slight different morphology, but again, the same thing happens as well and we, with very localized downward upward flows and latitude longitude dependence ut time dependence so overall the picture is really very difficult uh, complex uh, during storm time um, so those effects like, as i said is basically due to the um, proper penetration electric fields um, here's the uh, altitude of the hmf to the peak atmosphere layer um, normally, it resides at between 300 to 400 kilometers, average about 350 kilometers. Um, this is for a particular sector. This is the, so the mesh, uh, the mesh surface indicating the, he, um, the HMF2 height and the, the color corresponding NMF2, the peak electron density. Um, so uh, as the, uh, the, elect the penetration electric field taking place, you can see the very rapid rising of the um, ionosphere layers, and then after South northward IMF turning and then the, the rapid dropping of the heights. So those are, those are indeed just illustrated how dynamic things can happen during this you know, four hours period and dramatic change happening in the ionosphere, uh, mm, magnetosphere. And uh, these are the corresponding TEC maps during the time. So I don't, and you can see that the bifurcation of T, uh, TECs. Um, as uh, when the, the penetrate fields penetrate down to the lower latitude. So one important question has been often asked is how much of this TEC uh, is from below 700 kilometers and how much actually from plasma sphere um, above 1,000 kilometers or so. So using the coupled model now, we can uh, quantify uh, those things um, in terms of red contributions. This shown here the maps of the ratio of TEC up below 680 kilometers, those are usually we calculate from time GCM, then versus total TEC, which is integration from uh, all the way to about 20,000 uh, 20, uh, kilometers. And so in the mid-low latitude on the day side, usually the TEC below 680 kilometers, it's about, contribute about 40 to 60 percent. However, on the night side, in the mid-low latitude, majority of TEC indeed come from the plasma sphere rather than in the atmosphere itself. So this is some important uh, things to keep in mind when you're trying to interpret the TEC variations from uh, GPS measurements. And you have to know where the source region is. So I, and one more thing I want to show is the um, O plus H plus transition height. This is the altitude where um, 
ionosphere be from an um, oxygen dominated to become a hydrogen dominated, and it can during those uh, the penetration effect, and there are also changes at the mid low latitude when the um, the upward drift happens. You can the the transition are also increasing then the, when the um, northward IMF kick in, then the, the, the layer um, also lower the down in altitude. So um, again, just illustrating how dynamic the situation can be in the ionosphere. Um, just to drive the points home, and I want to say that is um, the, uh, the space physics is really on data striving. Um, so it is important that the numeric numerical physical, uh, physical space, the numerical models um, um, we, can, uh, we can utilize in you know, to not only um, providing a global context to interpreting localized measurements and also uh, fill, sometimes fill the data gap. So um, this is simulation um, um, for the April 2010 storm. This is actually quite moderate storm with TST only down to about minus 50 narrow test. But nevertheless, you can see that uh, even we got these kind of simulate uh, events, and the, the fact that we have unprecedented coverage in the thermosphere, sphere, there are three satellites, and uh, this is Champ, uh, Gochi, and uh, uh, Grace at a different local time. It's sort of a strategically local uh, a place, yet you can see that how when the storms then uh, kick in, and those with the three satellites, you see this really undersampled. So what I'm showing here, the left side is the Hems height integrated the dew heating on the left and the corresponding temperature and the neutral wind at the 300 kilometers. Okay, so I'll start here and while showing the movie. Oh, where's the movie go? Okay, okay um, be happy to take any questions if you have them. Thank you. Again, when you um, combined SAMI-3 with TIGCM um, and you showed uh, fluxes at 680 kilometers, uh -huh. were they vertical fluxes or field these, aligned? Uh, these are vertical fluxes. I just converted to vertical. Yeah. So, okay. So, sometimes they have a field aligned component if they're That's off the right. equator. Yeah. So otherwise. They, yeah. So, these are okay. two components, perpendicular and the field lines, then I project to vertical so direction. So, at the equator, those fluxes are vertical. Uh, e Mostly E cross B. That's okay. right. Yes. Thank you. Coming, Bob. Thank you. Um, it's I, very uh, difficult on to read those time scales and figure out exactly what the times are. How quickly does the thermosphere respond to the change in dual heating? So it depends where altitude is. So um, and also where's your threshold you set up. So usually, uh, in the upper atmosphere, as quickly as a hour or so, in, and in also depend on where location you look at. But the down further down to and the getting slow in the surface. I uh, was curious about some of your, um, your maps, uh, your Mercator maps of the November 9th uh, oxygen flow, and then your total TEC map, uh, show, show that th there's a strong, at least geographical correlation with the South Atlantic anomaly. Uh, and I, I, it puzzles me. I, I don't quite yeah. know the connection if there is one or if it's just happenstance. Do you have a comment on that? So um, the South Atlantic, I think normally during this case, is not very obvious because the penetration field is so strong. So it's totally um, overwritten, the, the possible effect there. So, I mean, South Atlantic normally will have... We'll I mean, go, go to the next, okay. uh, the, the TE, total TEC, I think it was, okay. maybe one or two slides later. Yeah. Um, yeah, I so mean, look at... Uh, this if, one, that's... Right, I, if, you, if you made a map of the SAA, uh -huh. you'd, you'd, you'd be right on top of that. Yeah, but uh, I, I don't think this is uh, directly related to Southwest, uh, South Atlantic normally, because sometimes you see, depends what day of the, uh, you know, what kind of back... Uh, IMF situation, background, neutral wind there. Yeah. But so I, I personally haven't seen not very well, obvious. I, I'm South puzzled South because I, w I have no there. physics to, yeah. to understand that. But yet the, the geographic correspondence is just amazing. Well, it's, it, it's, it's true for this event. Yeah, look like so, it, where it is. But I, I cannot make a you know, definitive okay. conclusion on that. I had a question about the next slide. I mean, the percentages of TEC. 
Um, I'm surprised about the night side. You're saying that most ionization is above 680 kilometers at night yeah. side? So the I mean, the F2 region still is maintained the reasonably well overnight. So well, I'm, I'm still be because of the volume getting so big, that plasma sphere. So even though it is maintained, but it is still quite small, much smaller than. So it is just. So where is this plasma? It's. Uh, it, it, but the ma I think the another thing is that your denominator also, sm uh, you know, the changes. Yeah, if you. Oh, sorry. The TEC on the night side, it's small. The mag magnitude is small as okay. well. So th both effects. I think. Okay. Yeah, I was a little surprised by your maps of the en ionizing energy input by electrons because I didn't see the evidence of the diffuse auroral These precipitation in, in that. Well I, could see, I could see the discrete arc. But where would be, I mean, where is the uh, diffuse auroral? Those are, those are mostly diffuse aurora. So those protons are diffuse aurora. But it's the... the no, I'm talking about electrons. Oh, yeah, electrons. Yeah, I, I think this is not the most strong event of the ring current dissipation. If we yeah, because the diffuse aurora one. tends to be the seen mostly around from midnight yeah. to the, uh, the right. dawn side. That's right. So the January, for example, the January 2005 event, January 21st, and the elect ring current dis uh, energy flux is much stronger. Uh, and it's much, much intensified, so you do see much bigger in effect. So it, it, it's a, it is a very Swiss event. It depends on how energetic those particles and how strong the dissipation, the dissipation is. So uh, answering Dave Klumpar's question about the South Atlantic anomaly, uh, since the uplift velocity in a prompt penetration field is uh, E cross B over B squared, so it's proportional to 1 over B, so with a lower magnetic field by 30%, the uplift velocity of the ionosphere is 30% larger you get a much bigger increase in TEC there. 